the, there are three books, as Judd mentioned, that I'm going to talk about here in no particular order, but I'm glad to see we have a mixed audience here. We have kids, we have old people like my friend Tom O'Toole from USA Today, um, and, and many others. But the three books are Season on the Brink, which as Judd mentioned was my first book. It came out 25 years ago. I wrote it when I was 12. Um, one on One, which is my most recent book, which is actually keyed to the 25th anniversary of Season on the Brink. And Rush for the Gold, which as Judd mentioned is coming out uh, this week. It's the sixth in a series of, of kids mysteries I started writing a few years ago. And, uh, the, there's a story behind how I came to write those, those books and uh, when you have kids of your own and many of you in here clearly do uh, often you read with your children and I did that with my oldest child Danny who's now 18 taller than me and refuses to speak to me most of the time but uh, back when he was several years younger and did speak to me uh, we were reading the Harry Potter books together and as he got a little bit older, we read a book called Hoot, which is written by Carl Hyacin. How many of you here have, know about Hoot? It was eventually made into a movie. Uh, Carl Hyacin is one of the great fiction writers of our time. And by, uh, by luck, uh, Carl Hyacin and I are represented by the same agent, Esther Newberg, in New York City. And I wanted to drop Carl a note to tell him how much Danny and I had enjoyed the book. So I called Esther's number and her assistant at the time, uh, Christine Bauck answered the phone and gave me Carl's email and said to me, uh, have you ever thought about writing children's books? You tell stories about your kids all the time. I had two at the time. Uh, and uh, why would you consider doing that in the sports genre? And I thought, wow, that might be fun. So I came up with this idea to write a book uh, that set at the final four. It was called Last Shot. And Two kid writers, two teenagers, win a writing contest that actually exists. They go to the final four, they stumble across a mystery, and they end up solving it together. Now, six books later, the following has happened. Uh, Last Shot won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Mystery Writing, which was a great thrill. Uh, I married Christine Bauck, and we have an 18-month-old child together. So writing kids' mysteries can really be a good thing. Um, <laughs> So I, I'll talk about Rush for the Gold a little bit later, but I think a lot of people uh, often wonder about how Season on the Brink came about. And when I, when I started to write one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to go back and see a lot of the people that I've dealt with through the years in various books, uh, many of whom I hadn't seen for years. I wanted to run down some of the characters from Season on the Brink, and in my mind, the book was always going to end with me going to talk to Bob Knight 25 years after the book came out. Now, some of you would probably know O'Toole's heard me tell this story, but I'll, when Season on the Brink came out, uh, Bob Knight wasn't happy with it. And the irony of it is most of the time as a reporter, you get in trouble because somebody says, well, the story's not true. You didn't quote me accurately. In this case, Bob Knight was unhappy because I quoted him too accurately. <laughs> Uh, there are certain words he uses often, uh, his favorite of which rhymes with duck and luck, uh, that appeared in the book, and he was not happy about this. So at one point he was asked by one reporter uh, uh, what he thought of me, and he said that I was a pimp. And at another point he was asked by another reporter what, what he thought of me, he said I was a whore, excuse the language, but it's true. And I was asked on, on, I was interviewed on NBC about this whole controversy because I was banned from covering a game at Indiana. And Ahmad Rashad said, you know, Coach Knight has called you these names. How do you respond? I said, I wish he'd make up his mind so I'd know how to dress in the morning. <laughs> uh, it's an issue, what can I tell you? Um, the book ended up, as Judd mentioned, becoming a number one bestseller and launched me, allowed me to go on and keep writing the books that I've been writing for these last 25 years. Eight years later, uh, I was in Hawaii covering Maryland in a, in a, in a tournament out there, because somebody had to go, I volunteered. And uh, I was walking back into the hotel after a game with Gary Williams, the now retired Maryland basketball coach, very laid back, as I'm sure all of you from around here know. Uh, and Gary and I, as we're walking into the hotel, we see Knight and a friend of his walking this way, we're walking that way. And Gary says, uh-oh, here we go. And uh, much to my surprise, Knight turns around and he says, hey, John, hey, Gary, how's it going? And he starts talking as if, you know, we last talked at lunchtime. 
as opposed to eight years earlier. Is that my cue, Judd? Do I have to get off train? Uh, so uh, after we'd spoken for several minutes, we walked away, and Gary said to me, after all the things he said about you, why would you even speak to him? I said, because he built my house. And on that note, um, so that was season, that season on the brink, as I said, allowed me to go on and, and keep writing books. And I wrote a book called The Season Inside, which was really on a year in college basketball. I spent a lot of time with people like Mike Krzyzewski and Jim Valvano and Dean Smith, and as Judd mentioned, Steve Kerr, uh, and many others, Larry Brown, Danny Manning, and became close to many of them. And most of you here, how many of you here are Maryland fans? Okay. So you all hate Mike Krzyzewski, right? With a passion. And Duke gets every call, right? Every call, they get every call. Okay, when I first knew Mike Krzyzewski, Duke couldn't beat anybody, all right? His second year, Duke was 10 and 17. His third year, Duke was 11 and 17. They ended the season losing to Virginia in the ACC tournament 109 to 66. Think about that score for a second. So now, Krzyzewski's job is in jeopardy. He's been at Duke for three years. He's 38 and 47. He's got Dean Smith, who just won the national championship, at, at North Carolina uh, on his left. He's got Jim Valvano, who was about to go win a national championship on his right at NC State. So things were not looking particularly good. Uh, and in fact, this is what it was like for Krzyzewski to recruit in North Carolina, or against North Carolina, excuse me. He went out to recruit a kid from California named Mark Akers. And of course, Dean Smith, as I said, had Michael Jordan, he had James Worthy, he had Sam Perkins, and he was going to win the national championship. He was God in the state of North Carolina. So Krzyzewski's in the home of this kid, Mark Akers. And as a coach, you know sometimes when a visit's not going well, and this was one of those nights. But he had to go through with the ritual, so he kept talking about Duke and why it would be great for Mark to come to Duke. And Mark Akers' mother never said a word the whole time. So finally he looks at her and he says, Mrs. Akers, is there anything you'd like to know about Duke, anything about our academics, how Mark would fit in, what it would be like? She says, no, 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 I don't need to ask any questions because the only thing that's important is that Mark go to college somewhere where he'll be close to God. And Krzyzewski says, well, you know, if he comes to Duke, God will be coaching 10 miles down the road in Chapel Hill. <laughs> Didn't get him. He went to Oral Roberts. It was worth the effort. But now in, this, in March of 1983, after losing 109 to 66 to Virginia in the ACC tournament, Mike Krzyzewski is in a Denny's in Atlanta at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's there with one of his assistant coaches, Bobby Dwyer, his sports information, Tom Mickle, and two reporters. One of them was a guy named Keith Drum, who's my best friend who now works for the Sacramento Kings. The other one was me. And we walked in and we sat down and the waitress brought us water and Tom Mickle, the SID, held up his glass and he said, here's to forgetting tonight. And Krzyzewski held up his glass and he says, here's to never blanking, forgetting tonight. And the next 16 times they played Virginia, they beat him. Now in 1991, when Duke won the national championship, Krzyzewski's first national title, I was on the court because they let the media on the court when the game's over. And I saw Krzyzewski and I walked over with my hand out to congratulate him. And he shook hands with me and he says, we've come a long way since the Denny's, haven't we? So he didn't forget. He remembered that night vividly. And when I was working on one-on-one, -on -one, I went down to spend a day with him. One of the things I tried to do, as I said, was go back to see people I'd spend time with. Went down to spend a day with him on the day that he was going to go past Dean Smith on the all-time wins list.